Hello and welcome to Acute Inflammation. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk about inflammation. Inflammation is the first line of defense. And like this castle that is being surrounded by walls and a moat, we have these different lines of defense that are going to help your body to be able to fight off any invader. Now that could be a bacteria infection, that could be maybe a foreign body that has entered the body. But this first line of defense piece is first of all going to be the skin and the secretions, kind of like the moat there. And then we have our second line of defense, like the big, tall, strong walls of the castle, which is our phagocytosis and inflammation. So these are our initial pieces that are going to happen, the initial types of defense that we're going to have against any kind of invader in the body. Once that invader gets into the body and we trigger inflammation, inflammation itself will trigger the immune response. So if there are specific antibodies that are already produced, they will be mobilized. And if we don't have antibodies to this particular invader, the immune response will start to develop these antibodies. And then we will have a long-term type of immunity. So the first piece in the puzzle is we have the barriers, the skin, the secretions. Then we have inflammation. That's kind of the second line underneath the skin. It's going to try and get rid of whatever this thing is. And then we're going to trigger the immune response. So some different causes of inflammation. The picture over on the right is showing a foreign body here, a puncture wound. And you can see that as that puncture wound occurs, we have a rusty nail, of course. And how much worse can you get, right? So you got a rusty nail here going through the skin, puncturing into the tissues. And we don't want the rust and the dirt and everything else, bacteria, etc., that is on that nail to be able to get into the bloodstream and cause the patient to develop a sepsis. So let's go back to the damage piece. It could be ischemia that's causing the inflammation. So anything that is damaging cells in the body, so whether that's ischemia, trauma, burns, chemicals, anything that is damaging our cells is going to trigger inflammation. Irritation, maybe from a high temperature, so burns, for example, or even a body heat and a high temperature. Chemicals and allergens will also trigger inflammation. Foreign bodies and infection, ingestion, so ingesting a foreign body and we've all probably had at some point in time in our life some kind of a GI bug or some food poisoning from ingestion of a foreign body and other types of material foreign bodies like what we're seeing here with a rusty nail. So there's three main things that are occurring when we have inflammation. Starting over on the left-hand side there, you see the tissue injury part. And we have that initial release of our chemical signals, which is primarily histamine, that is starting the process here. So there's our injury, there's our rusty nail, looks a little bit cleaner here. And then we have our chemical signals, and we have the bacteria, the skin surface, etc. They're all going to be disrupted and irritated, and that's what's causing inflammation to begin. Next, you can see in the second slide over in the middle, we have inflammation occurring. And that inflammation is going to cause dilation and increased capillary permeability. So we want to get more blood flow to that area so we can get all these nice white blood cells there and we can get all the nutrients that are needed in the area to be able to heal. So therefore, we're going to have vasodilation. The second piece is capillary permeability. It doesn't matter how much blood flow we get to the area. If those things can't get out of the vasculature and into the tissues, it's not going to be much use. So we have to have capillary permeability. Next, over on the right-hand side, we have phagocytosis. So these phagocytes will start to consume the bacteria and the cellular debris. So they are the ones that get rid of all the stuff. They get rid of the rust, the dirt, the bacteria, etc. All of that stuff that entered that wound so that we can start to heal up. Let's take each one of these with a little bit more detail. We have our initial insult. So the nail punctured the skin and we've got that silly thing sitting in there and we have that trauma from the nail that has damaged the cells. Foreign body, 
will also, or foreign material, will also enter the body. Okay, so there's going to be bacteria on the skin. There might be bacteria on that nail. And those things are going to enter the body too. So bradykinin is going to be released. And first of all, that's going to activate pain. So you'll say, ow, I stepped on a nail. Then the mast cells and basophils are going to start to release histamine. And histamine is going to be that primary initial mediator of our inflammatory process. Next, we have the vasodilation and capillary permeability part. The capillaries will dilate to increase our blood flow, and this is caused by bradykinin and histamine. We saw that previously. They were previously released, and they are going to stimulate those capillaries to vasodilate so we can get more blood flow to the area. Now, what we're going to see in our physical exam is going to be redness, redness, swelling, maybe warmth in the area. Capillary permeability occurs. Neutrophils and monocytes are going to start to leave the capillaries, get into that tissue, and start eating up that bacteria, the rust, and anything that's foreign, anything that doesn't belong there. Those neutrophils and monocytes will eat it up and get rid of it. Okay, that's their job. Fluid is lost, though, and that's going to cause swelling. So as we have capillary permeability, you know, the capillaries are pretty good about maintaining the wall there and making sure that we're not getting a lot of fluid leaking out. But when we have lots of neutrophils and monocytes leaking out of the capillaries, some water is going to follow, and that's where we're going to get our swelling from. Then we have the isolation and repair stage. So as you see on the picture on the right, the phagocytes are going to consume the bacteria and cellular debris. Clotting starts to seal off that area. So again, our, our platelets are going to be activated, and the pl activated platelets are going to go into that area, and they're going to clot off those vessels so that we don't bleed to death from a little puncture wound, right? Phagocytes, the monocytes, neutrophils, macrophages, so those are all our phagocytes. They're all coming to that area to start to eat up all of that foreign material. Acute inflammation has three main components. We have vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting. The process is going to be the same regardless of what's causing the inflammation. So whether it's the process of stepping on a nail or it's the process of developing a respiratory infection that leads to ARDS, that acute inflammation process is the same vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting. So let's take a look at some of those symptoms of inflammation. And here we can see some redness and swelling in that area of inflammation. Okay, there's your vasodilation part. You might get some exudate, so we might see some drainage from that wound as well, and that's going to be our capillary permeability. And then we have pain, of course, that is going to be the release of chemical mediators, primarily the bradykinin. So here you see kind of a blow up of that initial phase there where we've got the uh, very beginning piece, the endothelial cells have been disrupted and our mast cells are going to be activated. They're stimulating histamine release and then our cytokines are going to be released and uh, all of those things are going to start attracting white blood cells to the area causing that vasodilation and capillary permeability. The neutrophils come to the area and then they start to eat up all of that foreign material so that the body can start to heal. We can also get systemic symptoms as a result of inflammation. Fever and chills, okay, these are caused by pyrinogens. And the reason why we're having fever and chills is because the body is trying to increase the temperature so that the temperature of the body will not be a good place for bacteria to live. So we're trying to kill off bacteria and viruses by increasing temperature so that they can no longer live in this environment inside our body. Fatigue and malice, they're caused by pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we also have some neurologic depression due to decreased activity. We're trying to kind of move all of that energy out to healing up that area that has been damaged. Headache. And this is some of those inflammatory mediators that are circulating in the bloodstream. They're going up to the brain and they're causing some irritation and inflammation. And the same thing is happening here with our GI system with those inflammatory mediators irritating the GI and neurologic systems. 
Some of the mediators of inflammation, we've talked about some of these already, but we have some that are immediate, some that are a little bit later, and then some that are really late. Histamine is immediate. So as soon as we damage that, as soon as we sprain that knee, as soon as we step on that nail, we're going to have histamine released. That's going to cause that vasodilation and capillary permeability. Bradykinin is also released very quickly. That causes pain. And again, capillary permeability and vasodilation. One thing I want you to note here, as we've gone through this, you've probably noticed in several places that there's more than one thing that is going to stimulate vasodilation and capillary permeability. There's lots of redundancy in our inflammatory response. That way, we can make sure there's going to be an inflammatory response to get rid of these invaders in the body. Prostaglandins are more intermediate. That happens a little bit later. Uh, continuing the pain, continuing to cause fever, potentiating the histamine effects. Uh, this is the part where a lot of our NSAIDs work, is to block prostaglandin release and therefore block pain. Leukotrienes, uh, that's the chemical that's responsible for chemotaxis more vasodilation, more capillary permeability. So you can see even after that initial insult, we're going to continue to have some mediators that are going to continue the process of vasodilation and capillary permeability. There are others involved in the inflammatory process, complement, cytokines, and platelet activating factor. Remember, we got to have clotting. Okay. Now, clotting occurs whether there's bleeding or not because it's part of the inflammatory process. So if your patient has pneumonia and they have inflammation in the lung as a result of pneumonia, they're still going to have stimulation of clotting. Try and wall off that area of, inf of infection so that the body can get rid of it. This is what leads to patients developing DIC when they have severe inflammatory syndromes such as the systemic inflammatory response. Laboratory signs of inflammation. Well, we're going to see an increase in our white blood cell count, possibly with a shift to the left. That's indicating that we have more premature or early type of white blood cells rather than the more mature ones. We can see an elevation in our C-reactive protein. That's a direct uh, indicator of inflammation. Uh, increase in fibrinogen, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, cultures, which maybe we can culture out some bacteria or whatever it is that's causing the inflammation, and maybe radiology. So in, in some cases, we're going to use radiology. Uh, for example, here is a ultrasound of a kidney to be able to detect where there might be some inflammation deep inside the body. To review, inflammation is nonspecific, and inflammation causes vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting. And those things are what's going to cause the symptoms associated with inflammation, which is redness, swelling, drainage, and clotting. Thank you for joining me for Acute Inflammation. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 